Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're going to continue in our pursuit of the revelation knowledge dealing with the sons of God. In our prior session, we talked about the glorification process, which would be the the capstone of the Father's master plan for the sons of God. They would reach a stage of glorification, and at that point, they would enter into the positions for which they were called in eternity. We also said at that point that they would be divided into two categories, kings and priests. And we discussed a little bit about the focus of the king's position in the millennium, that they would uh, inherit the former Luciferian creation to break the Luciferian influence over the millennia and bring about the restoration of the kingdom of God to the multitudinous abodes that comprise the Luciferian, former Luciferian authority. Today we want to take a look at the second position, that is the priests. <clears throat> we said last week that the priests would constitute a glory, which would be, in an essence, angel-like, and <clears throat> would proceed to step into the relationship of intercessors, go-betweens between the creation and the creator, instructors, teachers. Now, <clears throat> we find that Scripture teaches the hierarchy of angelic priests will dominate events of the tribulation period. These events take place after the Lord sets them in motion. In other words, the tribulation period will not commence after the rapture until the Lord initiates them from heaven. Turn to Revelation, the fifth chapter, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 7. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book or a scroll written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, either under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. So we find, as long as the book remains sealed, the things contained in it will not manifest. The Lord is found worthy to open the seals. In other words... Scripture is letting us know that he is the initiator of the contents of this book. He sets things in motion when the book is opened. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, one of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. When he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them elders, which are prayers of saints. So basically what's being said here, <clears throat> when he opens each seal, events take place on the earth. The first seal, of course, deals with the white horse rider, which goes forth. Conquering and to conquer, and then it goes on to each seal until it reaches the seventh seal. So what we find here is the Lord initiates the events of the tribulation period. They don't take place until he sets them in motion. When this takes place, the angel priests 
initiate the function for which they are authorized. Scripture teaches the highest of the angel priests will remain in the temple and not leave until the return to earth <clears throat> with Christ. Turn to Revelation 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. So what we find here, <clears throat> this is authority being delegated to the angel priest which is unprecedented because he will have etched within him the name of the Father, the name of the, the, of the Son, which is the authority to speak in the name of the Father and to speak in the name of the Son. Yes. But we to understand that him that overcometh equals the priest. No. Because you have the overcomer that will be a king also. Overcoming is so those two classes below. Right. That yeah. Is there anything else that it, that it could be? No. Prerequisite for those positions is to be an overcomer. Right. <clears throat> so, in essence, this is referring to the angel priest who becomes a pillar. We want to note the description that's given to this particular overcomer. He will be a pillar. What is a pillar? A pillar is a support in the temple and he won't go out. What does that mean? It means he is, <clears throat> it is of necessity for him to remain in the temple supporting the things that he is called to support in the temple and not leave. Why? Because if he leaves, it will disrupt the process, the procedure, the Father's plan that he has initiated through this individual. That describes an administration, doesn't it? It also describes a high order of glory in the divine order of things. So he is impressed to remain in the temple supporting those things that will be forthcoming dealing with events that take place on the earth. It's essential that he does this. Now, having said that, <clears throat> <clears throat> scripture teaches this group, what I call the pillar angels, will be preparing the judgments that will manifest on the earth. At a set time, they will be given to the other angel priests to administer, to pour out. So, <clears throat> the pillar angels that remain in the temple are the initiators, the preparers of <clears throat> the judgment that the Father has given to take place in the latter part of the tribulation period and maybe even the midpoint of the tribulation period. Turn to Revelation, the 8th chapter, verses 1 to 2. Here we see the Lord initiating the final opening of the final seal. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So we find <coughs> the trumpets <coughs> that were given to them were manifested by the pillar angels within the temple because they contained the judgments that are going to be poured out on the earth. The seven angels are those that have qualified to administer the judgments. You have a hierarchy here of angel priests. 
<coughs> yes. Why are we told um, there was silence for the space of half an hour? What does that represent? It's referring to a um, what might be considered uh, <coughs> a state of preparation for events that are going to take place. So we find in the temple all the activity is taking place dealing with setting events on the earth um, influencing these events and ultimately causing them to experience judgments. Turn to Revelation 15th chapter verses 5 to 6. Again we see the same process. <clears throat> After that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, having their breasts girded with golden girdles. So, <clears throat> the pillar angels preparing judgments within the temple give into the hand of the administrating angels the judgments at a specific time indicated by the Father. Everything is choreographed according to the Father's Man. Those that have authority <clears throat> are all in the positions in which they are <clears throat> and have qualified to administer these things. It's a hierarchy. The temple angels have a higher position of glory than the administrating angels. Now we find <clears throat> Scripture teaches other groups have custody over other implements that will be used for judgment, but only the angel priests can administer them. Revelation 5, verse 8. <clears throat> and you took note of this yourself, Chris, the last time. Revelation 5, verse 8. When he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. So the elders <coughs> have the implements that will go into worship prior to the fall of judgment. But... <coughs> They do not administer them. They don't have the authority. They give them to the angels to administer. As you see, turn back to Revelation 8 now. Starting in verse 3. And we're going to read down to verse 5. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now this is what was in the custody of the elders. The incense and the prayers, which were in vials, <clears throat> they're given to this priest angel to administer. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. <coughs> and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. There were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now we find, why is it done this way? <coughs> the prayers of the saints, we have to understand this is tribulation period. And on earth, every single human being outside of a born-again saint is going to hate 
Christians. Track them down wherever they find them, afflict them, persecute them, kill them, use them for sport. <clears throat> it's going to be a horrendous time for Christians on the earth. The prayers that the saints <clears throat> speak rise up to the altar of the Father and they're captured in the vials by the elders. At a specific time before the judgments are administered, those prayers are released. When the judgments fall, the prayers will protect those saints <clears throat> from the judgment effects on the earth. It'll basically <clears throat> be wiping out areas, whole regions, uh, thousands, millions of people, but the saints will be protected because God will never fall, never allow his judgment to fall on his own people. Have the saints told when and what to pray for the prayers which are actually in that file? They won't need to. They're going to be praying for their need. And Safety, that, provision, about, yeah, right? <clears throat> protection, uh, but to have their needs met. Right. Because naturally, <clears throat> they won't receive from a a a a, 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 um, a human race that's been programmed to kill them on sight. <clears throat> so these prayers supernaturally will protect them and provide for them until they continue on to the end of the time when they will be delivered up. Because at that time, the, the mark <clears throat> is in, in order. Well, this one will take place before the mark. This is the first half of the tribulation period. <clears throat> but it doesn't matter because the world will hate Christians and be hunting them down. You're going to have two groups of Christians that come out of this. I'll give you an example. Turn to Revelation, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> This first group gets killed in the first half of the tribulation, not by any judgment, but by the Luciferians. And their <clears throat> soul comes up under the altar. Picking it up in uh, verse 9. We're going to read to verse 11. <clears throat> when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar... The souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. We're in Revelation 6, 9. Yep. Now we're going to go to 10. And they cried with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So it's the Luciferians that killed them, hunted them down, wiped them out. Verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now the prayers that you read about in Revelation the 8th chapter are protecting the second group. That's the only way they survive to the second half of the tribulation period. The first group wiped out, <clears throat> didn't pray, didn't do anything, uh, because of the swiftness in which events took, overtook them. That's why they come up under the altar. They come up naked. They have no robes. They can't even stand before the Lord. So right, white robes are given to them so they can come out and stand in the presence of God. Events are going to take place rapidly. When you read Matthew 24, it's telling us, then great tribulation, then persecution, then destruction, suddenly these things are going to happen. And this group didn't have time to repair. All they had time to do was repent before they got wiped out. And in their repentance, they gave a testimony to the killers about their stand for Jesus Christ. That's what saved them. And then they got butchered, but their souls go up under the altar. Scripture tells us consistently, watch, 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 because events are going to overtake those that are not weary, those that are not uh, uh, alert, and they're going to be swept away before they have a chance to make it right. But let's continue. We're talking about the angel priest. We got sort of sidetracked. <clears throat> 
Now, Scripture indicates it is the pillar angels that make pronouncements and give directions to others. <clears throat> Revelation 16, verse 1. In other words, it's the pillar angels that give the other angels the direction when to administer the judgments. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. So they have the authority to direct the angels that are going to administer the judgments when to do it. So the great voice is the pillar angel? Yeah. Is there a lead pillar angel? Are they all the same? No, the inference is that there's a group because he says, to he that overcomes, will I make a pillar in the temple. So there's more than one. Right, it's just that we hear one voice. So because of the unison. So they, they're all saying it. Oh, okay. How do we know that? Because he's saying as, as one. <clears throat> if it were <clears throat> more than one, it means that you would have an interruption in the time in which these things would be insane. But the time for the judgment is instantaneously. So everybody's speaking at one time as one unified command. The Father's program is so detailed and intricate that seconds, nanoseconds, instances are vital in the carrying out of his commands. And everybody is interconnected in a unity, in a harmony. And so when they speak, they're speaking as one individual. This brings us to the next principle. <clears throat> Again, we see direction coming out of the temple indicating it's a temple angel. Revelation 14, verses 14 to 20. <clears throat> now this you may find somewhat controversial, but uh, it's to be expected. I would expect nothing less. <laughs> Verse 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. This is the Lord. Having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. <clears throat> so what we have here is in the temple... A, the a pillar angel receives from the Father the time in which the Son is to reap. Only the Son is authorized to reap, but only the Father is the one who dictates the time for the reaping. So he directs the temple angel, the pillar angel in the temple, who directs another angel to exit the temple to give the instruction to the one that's on the cloud that his time has come to reap. And of course, it's talking about the harvest on the earth of individuals <clears throat> that will be ultimately brought into the kingdom at the time that the Lord returns. But this is after the rapture. It's after the rapture. We used to have people on earth, though. You have the rulers of the kingdom that have been raptured, you have the subjects of the kingdom that's still on earth, qualifying. Right. And, and they will be reaped. Those who qualify, in other words. God reaps into groups. Every one of us, no matter where we go, will be part of a group in eternity. <clears throat> Let's continue. Verse 14. <clears throat> Verse 16, he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. 
And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, and for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth. Now this is referring to <clears throat> the wicked. They're going to be gathered to judgment and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now notice verse 20. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horses' bridles for the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. It's about 200 miles. This is talking about the Battle of Armageddon. The angel priests are engineering events on earth to gather the armies to Megiddo for the great battle. <clears throat> now you find, understanding that the, the events on earth are engineered from heaven. Turn to Revelation, the 16th chapter. Here we see who does the actual gathering on the earth. <clears throat> Revelation 16, verses 13 to 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, demons, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, the Luciferians, and of the whole world, to gather, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So the angel priests on, in the heaven are engineering events that the Luciferians are going to manifest on the earth. Tribulation period is under the control of the sons of God in heaven. They're carrying out the Father's master plan. Now it's kind of difficult to comprehend. It is. <laughs> uh, i got to stop and give you a further clarification. Yes. Turn to Revelation, the 13th chapter. Picking it up, <clears throat> verses 4 to 5. And they worshiped the dragon, which is Satan, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who was able to make war with them? And there was given, there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Where did he get the mouth and where did he get the power? I understood the power to come from the kings of the nations. They already has that power. That's how he got into the position of preeminence. But additionally is given to him authority and power. Where does it come from? The Lord. To All power comes from one source. Right. To the to Father. To further his own plan. Exactly. Through the angel priests. It's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he could have just knew. Some fingers or something. <laughs> it's part of the inheritance of the saints. So the saints are told to basically take care of that. Yeah. Yeah. Remember what the Lord said. He said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Yeah. Now, as sons of God, the brethren have a joint inheritance. So of all things, the Father has given into the hand of the Son, and you have a joint inheritance as an heir, a joiner with Christ, that means that you're going to share in all things, all authority. That's why we're going through the stuff we're going through. Preparation. But let's go on. <clears throat> Verse 
Scripture teaches at times the temple will be inaccessible to anybody but the pillar angels within it. Revelation 15, verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke <clears throat> from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Why are we hearing the word man here? Well, angels are called men. They're also called gods of this new Still men. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand who it is that we're talking about. Man is the vehicle through which the creation exists. Jesus, glorified, is called man. No man in heaven, in earth, nor under the earth. Every knee shall bow of things in heaven, earth, and under the earth. Doesn't this sound to you like the Lord? God the Father has a greater plan than you know, any of us have understood so far only because of how high he's lifted the remade man. Yes, exactly. It couldn't be understood by corrupted human beings right. without the Spirit. The Spirit was not given until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter 9-10 to 10, Now have we received the revelation. Paul was one of the first to understand this principle. Most of the church didn't. Of what we can understand and what we found about the other existences, the other nations, the other life forms that will be over, mm -hmm. still doesn't compare with what is said about what he's going to do Thereafter, showing us new things, the, the glorified sons. Absolutely. In the ages to come. In the ages to come. Unexhausting things that you can't even imagine we're going to be experiencing for the ages to come. For, you know, and that's, I can't give you anything because <laughs> uh, it's a secret. <laughs> Could you help people who are hearing this information are totally astonished, astounded, because anybody would be, bearing in mind that um, most people have heard the, the typical Adam and Eve story and so on and so forth. Nothing like this you know, makes any sense at all. What would you recommend that they do upon hearing this? Research it. Study it for themselves. The Holy Spirit will always <clears throat> confirm a truth if you pursue it. Ask. Petition. Petition the Father for understanding. And then go through the first things that comes to your mind is open the book. Get in the book. And then things will start to come to you you, you could be reading something that you've read yesterday and you'll get a new insight. There will be something added to what you learned yesterday. It's unexhaustible. It will just be, con it will continue to be built upon. It will be painting more of the picture clearer for you. If you're seeking, you shall, you'll get. Yeah. Knock on the door will be answered. You, you know, you will, the Father will supply what it is you're asking for if indeed you're seeking Him. Sincerely. So the instruction is for each and every person hearing what Brace has just said is to spend their own personal time seeking a direct relationship with the word in the book and not giving it into the hands of a preacher or a minister or whatever to negotiate. And <laughs> By somehow, all means. Yeah, <laughs> some, some, somehow um, come up with whatever information they can possibly uh, put their hands on. It's, it's it's incumbent on each and every person to actually do the personal research themselves, and through that action comes the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Yes, yes. Okay, now, now the thing of it is, you see, each one of us is individual, mm -hmm. and we all are a member, members of a body, but mm -hmm. 
depending on what you're what you're doing with your life as a human yes. equates to what part of the body you you are and you got to ask the father what part am i do you know who, who am i what am i doing what's my position mm -hmm. what what you know and if you're if you seek it if you pursue it if you put yourself in the receivable position then it'll happen for you but it's not going to be overnight and it's not going to be soon it's it's a it's a commitment but it's what we are to do right. if indeed we are going to be with the father Well, let's continue. Scripture teaches, <clears throat> in addition to the angel priests who operate from the temple, others on a lower level will operate from the temple. As we said before, it's a hierarchy. Turn to Revelation, the seventh chapter, verse 13. <clears throat> One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. So these are everybody that went through the great tribulation is going to be impressed into a position in the temple. In other words, they'll become priests, but on a lower level. Now, Scripture teaches the priest angels are revelators of the works of Elohim. This is one of the things that the priest angel is going to be do, doing in the millennium, giving the revelation of the Father to the creation. <clears throat> Turn to Hebrews, 11th chapter, verses 9 to 10. We're going to see a work of the Father that ultimately will be revealed. Everyone there? Here we see Abraham. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was told about the city, that his destiny was tied into the city. And this is the main thrust of his whole life, looking for the city. Now drop down to verse 16. <clears throat> and this is what he was told. Same chapter. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So Abraham had a connection in this and claimed it as his life's endeavor. And so the things that took place in his earthly existence, the temple stuff, was always secondary. This was an eternal promise that Abraham ran with. Never let go. Now, where did the angel priest come in with this? That's how I feel about myself. There you go. Turn to Revelation 21, verse 9 to 10. <clears throat> now, 
Now remember what it says about this angel priest. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues. We read about that in chapter 15. <clears throat> These are given by the, the pillar angels who brought them into being in the temple. They administer them as judgments on the earth. So this is one of the seven angels that was part of that group. Now he comes to John, and he talks to him. And there came to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me, and showed me, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And he takes him on a tour of the city showing him the length, the breadth, the height, the structure, everything pertaining to this city. <clears throat> he has the ability to relate reality to John. Now, having said that, we find something very interesting. Turn to Revelation 22. Verses 1 to 2. <clears throat> Same angel. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded a fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So he gives John a vision and revelation knowledge about things taking place in the eternal state pertaining to the highest state of existence that is where the Father is. Yes? Is that description the same water of life that Jesus was talking about to the woman at the well? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Only in its fullest. You experience... The water of life here, which you don't experience in its fullest because you're still in a corrupted state. There you experience in its fullest. It has to do with the Holy Spirit manifesting an, an, an eternal life experience. Now, having said that, I want you to focus on this angel who just showed John these things. He shows him the new Jerusalem in its fullness. He shows him <clears throat> the throne room, river of life, flowing from the throne into the vast regions, becoming a river of life in the heaven of heavens. Tree of life on either side. Now, drop down to Revelation 22, verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. So he was so caught up in the glory, the power, the ability of this angel that he worships him as God. Then said he to me, See thou do it not from thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the saints of this book, worship God. He's telling him he's the saint. So we find that the judgments are going to be administered by the angels who are glorified saints. The revelation of the intimacy of the Father will come to the, the, the angel priests who are saints. They have what's called the spirit of prophecy. That's a revelation <clears throat> that the Holy Spirit will manifest in its fullness to them. So they will have access to revelation of events in the ages to come, which is what he's showing John. The Holy City has not descended yet. The new heaven and the new earth have not come into being yet. 
But John sees all these because the angel has the ability to show him these things. Now, having said that... Hang on, why don't you add what you told me the other night about John putting his head on Jesus' Jesus' lap and being familiar with angels, knowing the difference between angel, and he goes to worship this angel right? because... The glory is so, so intense, great. he can't differentiate in his own mind that this is only an angel. This has to be, it's, it's, it's a much higher angel. Mm. But we discussed that. That's what we discussed yesterday, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, there's a new revelation. There's two angels that John worships. Turn to Revelation 17th chapter. Verse 1. <clears throat> and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. Now this is a different angel out of the same group. This angel shows him revelation before the other angel shows him in Revelation to twenty. First chapter. There came unto me, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vows and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore to sit upon many waters. So this angel shows him the harlot city, shows him the, the, the fate of the harlot city, shows him the vast destruction that will take place during the first half of the tribulation period and the depth of <clears throat> the events the depth of events that will lead to the coming of the beast now yes how do we know this is a different angel it's not the same one because John tells us one of the seven angels in both cases. If this was the same angel, then John would have said in Revelation 21, and the angel that showed me the vision of the harlot city came to me and showed me. But he just says it's one of the seven that had the vials. Right. Now, turn to Revelation 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. <clears throat> John would not have done the same thing twice to the same being. He would have known better. And he would have said in his heart, I'm committing blasphemy because he already told me not to worship him. So what we find, John is so overawed by the greatness of the power of the glorified sons of God that he who walked with Jesus three and a half years and saw Jesus' power on earth, saw him transfigured on the Mount of, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, still can't differentiate that this is once, was once a created being the awesome experiential as a human in the presence of one of these glorified beings mm -hmm. to the point of glorification because we do know that there's going to be a difference in glorification between the priest and the kings. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And note, John is not awed by the, the glory of the elders, although they do have a glory and they're awesome. He's awed <laughs> by the glory of the priest angels. Now I'm going to take you into a further revelation. It blew my mind when it this was revealed to me. <sighs> Neither one of these angels, as highly exalted as they are, are the angel that's overseeing all of this. The angel which shows the overall revelation to John 
the one that showed him the harlot city, the one that showed him New Jerusalem, is not the angel that is spoken of as giving the revelation. Turn to Revelation, the first chapter, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now we see that angel, Revelation, the fourth chapter, verse 1. We hear him, but we don't see him. <clears throat> After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. This is not the angel, neither one of the angels that John tried to worship. Turn now to Revelation 22, verse 6. This is the angel that showed John New Jerusalem and the bride. Now he says in verse 6, And he said unto me, <clears throat> These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So he's saying he's not the angel that God gave the revelation to originally because he's talking about that angel. Now, drop down to, yes. I've got a question. Why is it referred not just prophets, holy prophets? Because they have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Talking about New Testament prophets. Old Testament prophets were consecrated, but they were not born again. Therefore, they didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. They were not regenerate. So the Holy Spirit can only come from what we're calling a saint. New Testament. New Testament. Who has well, the Spirit within them. Who had the born again experience. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, now turn to Revelation 22, verse 16, and we're closing with this. <clears throat> I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So what we're looking at here is this whole book of Revelation is being shown to John by this angel. But you don't see him because he is so far beyond detection that what you see is what he's showing John. So John doesn't try to worship this one because he can't see him. He can't see him. So you can only hear the voice. It's a hierarchy of angel priests, which goes off the charts for being glorified. Now this angel that you can't see that showed John all these things is the one that has the book. Oh, we haven't we ever told him about the book, did oh, we? Thanks. When are we going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> How about next week? I thought you hide that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't want to give them too much at one time. Right. Okay. But you're getting an understanding of the hierarchy. You're going to fit in somewhere in this hierarchy, depending upon how astute and committed and willing to lay it all down you are now. And to endure the stuff that's going to come at you by the world and not be intimidated by it. That's why we're coming 